Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast episode something something. I lost count. We're just talking to cool creators. And today we have the amazing, talented Jordan Taylor, who is a digital effects wizard we first met in the Unlike Pluto project, which was that trailer you just saw. So if you're interested in DFX editing or just trying to survive as a creative, I invite you to enrich your ears. Now let's go. Tell me about your life, sir. Tell me about your life. How did you get to LA? How long have you been out here? And uh, what was your path before that? All right. Uh, I've been here in LA about, I think it's five to six years. I think this is the six, 2015. So it's been five years moving our way into six. I came from New York. I was also in New York about I was in New York about four years, I think, total. I did some internships and stuff there, but I, I stayed out there. Lived in the different boroughs, worked freelance. I always knew I wanted to go to L.A. Uh, like, because when I was in college, I interned in, New York, in L.A. first, then New York. I got a feel for the two before graduation so I could know, because I knew those were the two hot spots to go for motion graphics. Um, but ultimately I took the New York position because I got offered a full-time job. And at the time, um, I didn't want to, uh, freelance because all the freelancers I made friends with during my internships, they all, all of them pretty much told me that when you graduate, you should go full-time first for at least like one or two years or so to try to get a feel for the industry and the, in the process and then go freelancing and they say all of them were like go freelancing and make money right like that was always what they would say so i tried to do that i went to this company called super fad and they were like really cool company they were kind of like psyop and um like a big motion house that was around for like 10 plus years they had a they had a la office seattle was like the home base and new york office was like a, another branch of theirs and um great directors great team. I took a, a lower paying salary to just to work with them over like another company. Yeah. And, um, cause they had, did you, have to make, did you, did you, do you think taking that lower pay was worth it just to get the quality of experience that you oh, were yeah. going yeah, after? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, man. I, I mean, I met, uh, well, one of the dudes who became my roommate in New York, he also worked there. I, the, the talent, the caliber of artists was the, the, the caliber of artists that were there were much better and then also the culture and the, the the atmosphere and I just felt comfortable there one actually the art director that sat right in front of me that I got really close with man I was like a huge fan of him in college and I didn't know that that's who he was like every time when we were in college and you would present like some artist's work or you had to show something or if we're just shit bullshit with my friends or whatever in the lab, like we're talking like, yo, check out this dude's work. And he wasn't even a motion graphic per se, like artist. He's a super talented illustrator, but he got a job as an art director in motion graphics. And for the illustrators out there, if they don't know, they make amazing motion graphic, like creative and art directors, because that's a skill if done and, 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 cultivated in in the right direction in motion it it's just it champions a lot of artists you know i love that man so you kind of had the new york experience and the la experience and now you've been in los angeles for about five years now yeah what was what was your journey like when you first decided to come to la were you freelancing did you move out here without a job or how was that journey for you i um i came out here knowing i was in a freelance I worked at a studio called Radley Studios, who I established a relationship with actually back when I was a student. They didn't know I was a student, so I freelanced for them a little bit here and there. They're up in the Wiltern building, like on the 16th or 15th floor in Koreatown. Yeah. That was my first uh, gig when I first came to LA. Like, it was like, it happened really fast because I was very active and I was talking about IF, Imaginary Forces, and quickly like in that transition i went to sci up for like a week or whatever i did a little thing with them they're over in venice uh but then i hit up this game company riot games that i was slightly talking to at first i didn't know who riot games was i didn't i never played computer games i was mostly consoles i never played or even heard of league of legends and yeah. 
I was really interested in Naughty Dog. So I was hitting up this dude, Anderson Cooper. Or no, what's his name? Jonathan Cooper. Anderson Cooper. Is Anderson awesome. Cooper, Jonathan. yeah. <laughs> this dude, Jonathan Cooper, right? Yeah. Uh, super really talented uh, animator, character animator. He was the lead character animator for um, Assassin's Creed 3. Oh, wow. And yeah. that was like one of my favorite Assassin's Creed. And then he did, uh, he was the lead dude on uh, Drake's, uh, no, Uncharted. The Drake song. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Drake's right. Fortune or something like that. So he did all the, or he did the, the third one and the fourth one. Anyway, talking with this guy, trying to get my way in a Naughty Dog. I know it's in Santa Monica or whatever. Hit up Riot, Rando, talking with them. Once I mentioned about me working at IF, they were like suddenly interested, right? Right. But I had to go through this like two month uh, interview process they were also like transitioning from their previous studio that was in the colorado building in santa monica there's viacom and some other places over there yeah. and then now they're off of i think it's i think it's pico or wherever riot's home base is now in santa monica i'm drawing a blank on the the street that it's off of but it's amazing it's like one of the best places to work in los angeles like hands down um I really was excited about going there. I got to do the Annie's, like if you were to go on YouTube and put Annie origin, like the whole, I got put on the creative development team and we were in charge of, it was like the first time they ever doing a motion graphic piece. And the idea was like, we worked with uh, writers, composer and illustrator who sung Kim, who super good dudes, nasty. He's actually <laughs> over at, he's, he's over at Sony right now doing the new uh, Boondock season. He's the original dude. He's like the illustrator for the Boondocks. And yeah. uh, he went to Korea for like the other seasons and like taught the whole team how to do his style and everything. That's so sick. Like, so, really so when you first came out, that was kind of your first real foot in the door for your industry? Uh, that was my first time. I wouldn't say in my industry necessarily because Riot and being in the game industry, they're – their understanding of motion graphics is very different. Like they don't, it's not a traditional motion graphic house, but they were trying to do that. And that's why I was so excited about it was because I just straight up did style frames, but I, it was even better than doing style frames at a normal motion graphic company because we were working with writers. So we were actually building this whole thing from scratch. And then my appreciation for music and stuff, so then we had a composer, so I got to give feedback on the music and things like that. And this is before I was doing any music production. Right. And Riot's actually the reason why, like, I had started that, why I got re-motivated to do music and stuff. So when I left Riot, I transitioned into music. I did some music school. Like, Riot let me take two, like, half days off during the week to take a course. So then I transitioned. I wanted to get back like towards the end of that Annie project, I wanted to get back into freelancing because I was feeling like I was losing touch of like the motion graphic scene. Yeah. So what would you say hitting on that point, having kind of a consistent gig with Riot versus freelancing, what are the pros and cons of each situation? Well, here's the cool thing about that. Actually, if you, here's the thing, if you can do a uh, permanent with a company that's like Riot, uh, I can only speak to Riot right now because I don't know if Netflix and some of the other bigger uh, corporations are, are doing this, but basically check this out. So freelancing, permalancing, right? So you're full time, but you're not on paper. You're going to get a check every week and for your day rate. If you're full time, you're going to get a salary and you're going to get a check every two weeks. Right. So that's, that's a valuable point. Yeah. When, bro, that makes a huge difference, dude. Yeah. It makes a huge difference because I'm doing, I'm doing bi-weekly now after working freelance at this agency in Burbank and they, they did the same thing. It was every week, every Friday you got to check as a freelancer. Right. A lot of companies in the entertainment creative industry, they do that kind of model where it's like a blend of like freelancing and contracting. Like when I first came out here, my first job was, a contractor role, but they would give me a day rate every single, I was there every single day of the week, basically though. And if I needed to take like a Friday or a, a you know, a random day off, it's not a big deal at all. Dude. And that, and I miss that. Yeah. I ain't gonna lie. Yeah. That's it is. Um, it is, it's very convenient because it allows you to kind of have that flexibility, 
But one con of that is that I didn't really feel like part of the team, like a lot of the other salary people, yeah. like you're putting in all this work and it's kind of like, Oh, he's just the video editor guy that sits in the corner or something like that. Yeah. You know? but, yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think the only time those permanencers start to feel like they're part of it is when you're there for like a year plus like consistent but then there's still moments, because even with Riot, there were moments where I was reminded that I'm not really a part of the, the right. squad. Like, com- do, like, the, <laughs> like company parties, right? Company. No, I did, they did, I did actually get to do that. Oh, that's so good. That was pretty cool. Um, but it would be just like little things. Sometimes it would come up in conversation even, like some of the other dudes. I don't know if they, how they were, you know, just little shit. It's what who at the end of the day it doesn't matter right like if you're if you're a true artist you care about make, doing passionate work and like money is second to that always right because you but can there get is a lot of money but there is a like, lot of uh, balancing the two right because I know you are you're one of the most creatively inspired people I know and you you love doing your own work you have your side passion projects but you also are a huge hustler in terms of getting paid gigs and working with reputable companies. And that was, that was something I definitely learned from you was that, uh, you know, you have your, your passions and stuff like that. And sometimes it it can't be directly what you do just for money. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, man. That's, and that's kind of like the, it is a balance. It's like a teeter. It's like a tug of war kind of back and forth thing because, you know, as freelancing, sometimes I'll take gigs that are, eh, they're not satisfying. And I'm in the situation now where I'm not, I've been freelancing for what, like, I don't know, it was like seven years. And then now I'm full time for the first time in a real long time. And, um, you know, that's, that's different. And there's, that presents different challenges even there. Yeah. But I think, um, you know, having those passion projects are really crucial, no matter what you do. Uh, because at the end of the day, if you're doing something for a company, ideally, you it's rare. You can find situations like Riot. I didn't have that passion. When I started music, that was my side thing at Riot because the project, once it got to a certain point in that project, it stopped being, it, start, it stopped uh, being uh, this like idea work. about design and and coming up with the ideas and creating and it was becoming more technical gotcha and it it kind of stripped away some of the things it it went back to the original stuff but like it started stripping away some of these things so that creative energy was getting sucked away yeah and even though you say would you say that having that creative energy being like fulfilled in your day-to-day job air quotes you know is is completely necessary or do you just try to divide it as much as possible? I mean, I think in the, in the most perfect world, you can create stuff you believe in and that you're excited to do. And it's for a company that's paying you. Right. But Mm. uh, what's your take on that? Cause I know speaking to your years of freelancing uh, that's, that's sometimes unstable and you kind of just have to pay the bills at some point. Right. Yes. And no. So no, well, I, well, no, it's not. That sounds worse than what it is. The truth of it is this: it's like it boils down to this, bro. It's like you make it, you make of it what you make of it, bro. So if you're freelancing, is this may be the hard truth for some people, but the fact is your skill set and depending on you, how much effort you put into your craft is going to determine that factor. Because yes you will inevitably through the process work on shit that's not so whatever it's not that creative and you're just doing it to get some money like that definitely is guaranteed but the more and more you get good at your craft the more and more that goes away and you can reach a point where you're literally only being hired to do the shit that you genuinely are passionate about that you're just like oh this is what i would be doing anyway but it's only because you put in so much hard work into that craft that you get that respect from other people that just be like, Oh, we just want, we just wanted to hire you to let you do your thing. And, uh, you know, show us, you know, like it's always turns into that. If you really push and push, I understand that the other side of freelancing, that there can be this, uh, 
unsteady. It's, it's uneasy. Um, but you kind of just got to like go, sw- it's like do or die, sink or swim kind of mentality that I've always approached to motion graphics, like through college that just helped give me that extra boost, boost so that when I was in the industry, people already kind of, I never, I've, I used to run into this early on in freelancing, like when I would have conversations like this and people would be like, oh man, you know, it's real tough. And if I said that, I just didn't identify with it. And people would look at it like, oh, like, oh, like I'm being arrogant or like, and it was just, it was more of a ignorant thing. It was like, I just didn't know. I just assumed that that was freelancing. Because again, my freelancing experience wasn't something I chose to do. I was like forced. It was like do or die. Like the the company ended. I was only there for a few months. So I sound like I had some severance package that was like, whatever that was dope so and i was in new york city this is like one of the most expensive cities at the time so i really had no choice but to i just put my head down bro i was like literally while i was being told that the company was shutting down i was on my phone texting my old professors people i knew like yo super fat shut down you know i was on it from boom right there when it happened like while it was happening yeah but i really think that kind of mentality is what has helped me never be in that position where I'm just like feeling like, Oh man, like it sucks. Now the thing is when you, when you, I have had moments where it's been slow where, and I've noticed that when I go, like for instance, I'm full time right now. I imagine if I were to go back to freelancing, it'll probably be slow in the beginning to, to pick up. Like I always have noticed that kind of thing when I've gone from being at one place for a while and then I go back, it's a bit slow to find, to get something. But once it's, it, 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 it's inevitable, once it starts going, it just goes, it goes, it goes. And then you're there and then one job's ending and the next one is picking up. They're hitting you up the same day that this one's ending for the next week. And it just boom, 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 boom. You know? I love that, man. Great. That's great. Yeah. I love that you have that mentality because, you know, some people can, can fall apart when everything, you know, ends, right? Uh, The first company that I actually worked, worked at when I moved out to Los Angeles, I had for about six months, completely shut down our branch, same thing, right? When you're in, I find that when I, when I was put in that position, the sink or swim position, it's like, all right, I'm in a very expensive city. I have no job. And now it's, it's all up to me to create my next opportunity. And I'm so thankful that happened in hindsight, because if if my first job went incredibly well and I was there for, I I would probably still be there for like, you know, five years or whatever now. And I think that having that experience really shaped that, you know, nothing is certain in this industry, but you just have to put your head down, man, and just attack. (laughs) Yeah. And it's dope because you were able to do that. Cause then look at the companies and like the side projects and the things that you're doing. I think that from what it sounds like, it sounds like that kind of put a little like, thing in you that like boom and then it opened up this whole new world and you're meeting different people and you're in a new city and stuff so like yeah that's that's why I always I always vouch I always vouch to my friends to you know build try building a life that you want to live and especially if you move to a new city it's like you have to almost reinvent yourself because it's like all right I I know no one it's up to me to create my opportunities and how you do that is like looking back at it in the moment I was just doing it right you're not aware that you're doing it but in hindsight you're like holy shit like I I put together the dots somehow to be exactly where I am today and I'm sure you can look back at your life too being in New York and Los Angeles freelance full-time and look at that you're like wow like anything can be possible because I literally just did this (laughs) dude yeah that's true and I wanted to ask you did you ever like um try like going to like i'm sure you did this actually knowing you like but maybe did you ever go to like meetups and like try to like get involved in that kind of way like the extra proactive kind of thing where like you go yeah yeah. well there's a lot of that here in los angeles which i love because there's always i think one of the most valuable things i went to was a music video directors meetup this guy named matt alonzo who's done some pretty big artists he's done like a tyler the creator video 
multiple other plugs of insert mm-hmm. famous name, but it, it wasn't necessarily exactly what I learned at that meetup. It was meeting the people that were all in Los Angeles with with me like interested in learning more about music videos and production and budgets and all of that and having access to all those people that I met to talk to you on Instagram or uh, network with further further down the line you know flash forward yeah. five six months later I got called yeah. on to another set because I just made a you know made a friend at this networking event basically um, Dude, that's the beauty yeah. of it that that's that's also one of the cool things about freelancing that That's one thing when I was younger that people didn't necessarily say when they painted the freelance picture. Cause I, I don't know, in retrospect, I think personally freelancing is better than full time. I get the idea of not feeling like being a part of the team. And I certainly know it cause I've expressed that in interviews and with companies that I wanted to work at and shit. And, um, and actually that's a really great thing to bring up in an interview if you want to try to get a job at a place, you know, and like they're feeling you, let them know you want to be a part of a team, you know? But yeah. I really do think one of the the great things about it is that like what you're saying is like, you get to meet a lot of people that you would never meet. And you get, to, because of meeting all these different people and being exposed to all these different companies, you're getting exposed to all these different workflows, different process, all these different things, all this new stuff. Your life is going to be longer because you're, you're going <laughs> to feel like everything's new all the time, right? You're not going to the same job all the time, every day, same thing, right? But then also that gives you growth. Like you're going to learn shit exponentially fa- faster than somebody who's going to be at one place and they're, they're they're only going to get input the same input all the time, you know, from the the same individuals. And I think one of your, to, to that exact point is the adaptability it takes to go into new environments and kind of process, you know, how the, their workflow works, how this group of people works together and learning how to adapt to those different situations is probably like one of the most important characteristics as like a creative, if you want to be a creative professional, right? Yeah. Like, cause you never know how, like what's up with your client. You kind of have to just take it as it comes and uh, you need to offer your skills that, that kind of uh, match their workflows and, and how they work, you know? Yes. And you, and what's cool about that is that you get a feel, you start to get a feel for certain things and that, you know, they become patterns and you start identifying certain patterns and different people. Cause you're also, if you think about it, right. We're, at the end of the day, you're just dealing with people. And so different kinds of people, you know, different producers, how they write emails, like what's the vibe, what's the vibe in the company. And then you got the technical side of it. That's like, well, how are they doing their folder structures or what are they doing for their like whole server situation? Right. And exactly. You got two different things you're playing with and it's all, and that, but that's, what's cool about it. Cause you know, you're getting to see different people and you get, and I don't know, I think as a person, like personally, like as a, as a person development, developing like skills and people skills. And, and if you're somebody who's passionate about that kind of stuff and like for me, I took it upon myself the last couple of years to like really dive into reading. I I ingest a lot of audio books, right? But I'll go through them, a same book, maybe like four or five times. I literally will go through the book and I'll finish. I will go back to the beginning. I will listen to it again because I want to. Make sure it's solidified, right? Yeah, because, you know, when you're in live, you ain't got time to refer back to whatever you heard. Like, I can't remember what I did 20 minutes ago. <laughs> but like, like for me, it's really helpful to do these things a lot where it becomes like a muscle memory kind of a thing. So yeah. like it allows me to react fast to things that I find myself like, Oh shit. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of these things naturally now because I ingested that thing so many times. Yeah. And that allowed me also that had effect on my uh, people skills, which I think also uh, as a freelancer, that's crucial. Um, when you respond, sim- simple things like using the term my pleasure, for example, it, it's very different than saying like no problem. Right. You know, like when you're you, as a freelancer, often you'll be asked certain things. You may also run into money issues. 
uh, where like you you're, know, you're asking them for where, a payment. Yeah, it's where like I'm then. getting offered a certain price where I don't feel it's worth my you know my In, uh, investment time right. or right. Yeah, and you it's a balancing thing because it, it there's a lot of things that play, go into that to determine whether you should take or continue a project, but. What I tried the summer that we met, actually, um, I believe it was in the summer, that I was going through this process where um, I read this book. It was called The Go-Giver. And I highly recommend this book to anybody, especially freelancers. But I think anybody in general can benefit from this kind of stuff. But, like, this idea, man, of, like, you know, I'm a go-getter. You're a go-getter. You know, you hustle. You go. But there's this other concept that's a bit of the inverse to that that I think actually gives you more rewards and is more uh, rewarding, right? Like, this idea of giving and doing things for others and putting the other person first. And that, as a freelancer when you develop a certain language that promotes that people will like you. So companies will remember the dude who's just like giving, who's going to do the thing that's going to, they're going to say, but now no, you got to be talented. Sure. Like you don't want to be no skills and trash and then be like, well, I, well, I said I would do it. You know what I mean? No, I was really nice. I bought you a bag of Cheetos. <laughs> right. Right. But Having that that sense of just even on a subconscious level, like that term, my pleasure, I think subconsciously it, it speaks to people in a way where it's like most people will say, the average person is going to say they're going to operate on a default setting, right? So they're going to respond like, no problem. Yeah, I can do that. No problem. No problem. And it implies like as if it could be a problem. Yeah. But when you're like, my pleasure, it's like, I'm happy to do this for you. Yeah, the little nuances that, that kind of make you – uh, more engaged with the client and potentially uh, you can kind of shape yourself in a more positive light in relationships just between human to human. Yes. But that's what freelancing is really. <laughs> it's being, exactly. being really good at your skill, obviously, but you're right. It is a people business, man. It's a total, it's a totally uh, person game, you know? Yes. And that's the, that's the beauty of like where we are today with technology, man, because you know, my background, you know, I don't come from uh, uh, a rich family or, or the nicest places and things like that. But um, what's great about today and this time is that a lot of people have access to information and the ability to gain this kind of information if they take it upon themselves or they believe in it, this idea that they can learn anything and do anything. Learning something to me has motivated me beyond that, that has had so much impact on me and my life and my creative work and freelance and everything, literally everything. When I yeah. learned music production, that for me, bro, was like that proved to me that I could learn anything. Right. Now, I don't need to be the best musician. That's not important to me. <clears throat> if I want to be, I'll go do that. But that's not what's important to me. Right. What's, what was so challenging was this idea of this thing that was seemed so like unattainable to me. Like, and I, it was so mysterious and I couldn't understand it. And it was like, and I just never went there, but it was always hanging over me. And then when I was in that class and I, and I hear the, you know, I'm in the only kid in class who never actually made any music. Everyone would show their stuff. And I was like, yo, I'm like real intimidated. And like, I'm like I could never make stuff like that. Like what the, how did you know i was so far removed from i in my journal i used to write and take notes i was like what is a melody and like i used to look up online like what's a melody what makes a good melody? what makes a good i would i was diving in bro like heavy yeah for sure that shit taught me dude i could learn anything and 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 now you, by having that mindset you feel like a in superhero like you feel like it's a power because the thing i think partly what makes it that is that a lot of people don't believe that so, yeah. yeah. Well, if you think of you think of the first time you opened an editing software, right? I was, I mean, I I used to mess around with iMovie back when I was making skateboarding videos with my yeah. friends, you know. But like nothing super super uh, powerful in terms of like uh, Premiere, After Effects, or Cinema 4D or anything like that. But I remember the first couple times I opened those programs, you're looking at all these buttons and you're like, I will never be able to understand this. 
but then the the little chunks of knowledge that you either learn the hard way or have to uh, research and just digest, you know, and, mm-hmm. and you start adding these little little bricks, right? And then all of a sudden, it becomes this whole this whole structure. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, dude. Uh, and that's you're, like that you're never done, though. You're never done. <laughs> that's true, and that's a good thing because yeah. at the end of the day, that's gonna that, if you do it right, you know, hopefully that gives you the perception of this long life, and you know, by the time you die, you feel like you went through, you did a lot of things. Oh, Will Smith has this whole like uh, story about him growing up where he talked about like a brick. His dad or, and made him and his brother build build a wall basically in their backyard or something like this. Because they said, like, oh, that's impossible. They can't do this thing. And he was like, oh, like, because they said that it was impossible, every day for a whole summer or something, they had to lay, like, one brick out in their yard or some shit. I don't know the exact details, but it's that essentially that story, where it's, like, they taught them that idea that you could do anything. Yeah. And that's kind of, like, when I'm exactly what we're talking to here. It's, like, right. yeah, you realize you see all this shit, and you're like, yo, that's impossible to learn, but you – you, you teach yourself that, oh, no, that's not, it's not really impossible. Right. And it's not just limited to a, a computer software. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, exactly. Well, it's anything, right? Anything. Yeah. yeah, dude. And that's what's super cool. So I have, I have a question regarding that. You know, a lot of people are like, yeah, obviously, if you put in the hours, you know, you can learn something. But how do I actually start, right? And for me, that's your inspirations, right? Like for me, editing and filmmaking is just a tool to express uh, my, a message that I feel like is worth telling, right? So yep. if you understand, like, why, b- remember why you started, right? You know, I want to kind of ask you, you know, how did you first get into it in terms of motivation and what inspires you to to keep learning this craft? Like, what is it, what is it for you that makes you sit down, whether it's for your uh, music stuff or your digital effects mm-hmm. stuff, you know? What, it, what inspires you to sit down and actually tackle these challenges? When I first started doing uh, design stuff in school, I was, I was actually on the verge of getting kicked out of the program because I was like taking Fs and zeros because I was doing football. And what there's two things. What inspired me then, I basically went to a teacher and was like, hey, what can I do to uh, get my grades up? Right. And he's like, you got to do work. And because all that energy I was putting into training and doing stuff for football, I just was like, okay, I quit that. And I took all that time and energy and I put it into design and staying. I didn't know how to download fonts. I didn't know anything. So I stayed after class. I would be there all day until the janitors would tell me to leave. Right. Because it wasn't an art school. It was just a normal state school. At this yeah. Time. At that time, what motivated me, I used to listen to a lot of music. And I used to listen to a lot of Lupe Fiasco. Yeah. And his lyrics, and I would read his lyrics and read his interviews. I was just, like, really obsessed. And I would take a lot of the concepts and the, the points of view, and I would internalize them and, like, spit them out in my way, but visually with my projects. And one thing I always had as a motivating factor back then was, like, I want to do something that was different than everyone in my class. I just had this in my head. It was like, and what that ended up turning into was basically making things feel more authentic and making things feel like kind of in motion. Right. And then that led me into my teacher showing me motion graphics. And he actually wrote a book. He's only, dude, there's only two people who wrote books on motion graphics. Both of them have been my professors at different schools. Hey. (laughs) And so he told me motion, he showed me motion graphics. Eventually I transferred to SCAD. When I was at SCAD, the biggest thing that motivated me back then was this, I went through this process in my internship in LA where long story short, I uh, was riding on a bike and I was so obsessed with, uh, back up, before I got to the internship at school, I was so obsessed with all the other students that were so much more talented than I was. And because they all went to school to be artists and stuff. And this was art school and it was all new for me. And so I was still okay because I had a work ethic, but I didn't have this like idea thing I felt, right? Everyone had great ideas and executed it well. A few select students are really good. I want to be the best. I like challenge myself in that way. So I'm riding these bikes. One day I'm competing with all these bikers I don't even know. 
and <laughs> bicycles, by the way. <laughs> so I'm riding on a bicycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, no Harleys. At the end, of, at the end of the day, I uh, at the end of the like at one point during the trip, I realized we all went different directions, and I was in the front, and I was like trying so bad to stay in the front. Weirdo competitive habit or something, right? And at that moment, a light bulb went off, and it was like, yo. You don't got to worry about nobody else. That helped me out in college where my motivating factor was all about what do I want to say as an artist, right? What's the story? And it didn't matter what anyone was doing. Now as an artist, what I do today is very similar. It's very similar. I just spilled my wine. It's very <laughs> similar um, where, uh, damn. I'm about to leave soon. Uh, yeah, no worries. Let's <laughs> let's, let's hit this. Let hit, let's hit this last point because yeah. I think it's super important. And then yeah. I'll I'll let you uh, I'll let you go. So today, as an artist, it's very. It's still much in the space of story and what my message is, what I want to say. But what's changed is that I've matured right over the years. As you get older, hopefully you're going to mature. And because of all the educating I've been doing over the, over time. I feel as though the things I want to say now are way more meaningful. I feel a lot of the things I was passionate about were a bit cliche. And so now I have developed a whole verbal language and like a mental language for myself, which is like, you look at it as like a plethora of like tools or, or yeah, like tools or things that you can use, right? To then now speak a message through this medium, whether it's music. I'm I'm working on an idea right now that's going to fuse like the music and my motion graphics. Just going to make short stories and create different artwork out of it. Still like still working, whatever. But being able to tell a story that's actually impactful, meaningful to us as like a rate, a human species and like, what motivates people or pointing out little things to people that give people an appreciation. Some of the things we've talked about in this podcast here are even those can be broken out and visualized in different metaphors, you know, that exactly, visually yeah. speak to people that are like, Oh, that's aspiring to make something that visually technically you're using a cool render, you're using redshift, you're doing this or whatever. It's a cool animation, but it has substance to it. You know what I mean? There's actually like a meaningful thing at its core where it's coming from. To me, that's my biggest motivating factor. Like that's that, what man. makes me excited to create things. And, and I've been writing songs recently and stuff too. And I've realized even through writing music, like lyrics and stuff, there's this correlation between design and animation. And right. You're always building on make. stuff, right? Yeah. And it's like, Having a core message that can be inspiring is really important to me um, because those are the things that inspired me, right? Like Lupe Fiasco was someone that was doing that and Kanye West and these kind of characters inspired me. It was more positive kind of rap for me at the time during like the whole Dirty Self era where I came from. Yeah. And it's all like vi- about violence and shit like that. And right. so those things were like really hit home. Yeah. I love that, man. Thank you so much for taking your time to, to you know, dude, talk about all your inspirations, me, bro. Me. I wish that we could go longer, bro. No, we that's have cool. We'll this. have to do it again. But one thing I wanted to hit on is just your absolute desire to spread positivity through your art. And it's been super inspiring. The little I've known you for the past, what, year or so to see everything that you create. And honestly... Uh, I remember those conversations we would have when we were talking about making visualizers or music videos with Unlike Pluto and like just being super inspired to to create something, you know, with a like minded person was it was awesome hearing it from you because it it's contagious. Right. Like I was not. Yeah. I was not ever like, oh, I have to do this thing or I have to jump on this call with this uh, designer. You made it fun and it's really contagious how inspired you are because, you know, that will just transfer to other people and you surely have proved it already, sir. Dude, I appreciate you saying that. And I still want us to work together because I also like to work with people that have that same kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like I get that same vibe from you from even before. That's why we were able to make cool shit. 
And I think if we were to do it outside on our own, which is just so difficult to do, <laughs> considering all the quarantining and then all the job shit, but like, yeah. it's always there. And I think like at any time, like we could always work at some point that that's all, I'm glad that that's always there. And to hear you say that. Yeah, man. That's even inspiring for me to continue to do this kind of, have this point of view, you know. Absolutely, man. Well, that's all we can do, right? <laughs> Just keep going, yeah. right? Yeah. Yep. All right, dude. We'll we'll stay in touch. Uh, we'll definitely talk more in the near future, and hopefully, once all the quarantine stuff is uh, news news of the past, we can get back out in action. 